Um, dear professor, thank you very much for taking a portion of your time on a Sunday uh, to be a part of our podcast and welcome. It's nice to be with you. Um, so you were talking about how it's like, regardless of it being a Sunday due to the COVID situation, um, we're all being pretty isolated. How are you spending your days in relative isolation these days? Well, it's uh, difficult. I take lots of walk. I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of cooking because we don't, uh, we don't go out uh, for food. So I actually, I'm learning how to cook and that's a lot of fun. I've never done that before. And uh, I uh, am keeping in contact with uh, former students. Uh, actually, I've um, given a, a few contact lectures uh, over Zoom. Uh, <laughs> how was it? How was giving the, the, the uh, It was very strange. I had never done that before. The, the first uh, lecture that I gave over Zoom a few weeks ago to an international group was miserable. It was just awful. I, uh, I didn't really uh, have a good feeling about how to do it. But, uh, you know, life has changed for all of us and we'll get used to it. Yeah, there's no um, live feedback, so to speak. There's no emotion at the moment, you know, the real feedback in terms of how the students are reacting to what's presented. Yeah, you, you can't see the, the faces, in, 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 the case, in this case, of international students, and I couldn't see their faces, so I was just talking to myself. And uh, as an old professor, that's a highly unusual thing to do. Usually you're talking to other people. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing like a funny image online, a meme, if you will, um, how usually professors are telling to their students to shut up, to not speak as much, whereas now they're begging them to talk, just say something, so I know that you're there. <laughs> Um, so, Professor, um, you know, with all due honor and respect, it's been seven decades, I believe, since you first started out your research. And that's like three and a half times more than I've been alive. <laughs> so, basically, looking back on all those seven decades, how do you feel about them? I feel pretty good about them, uh, as a matter of fact. It, it's, it's been a lot of fun and it's been quite an opportunity to be at... Uh, not the beginning, but, uh, but close to the beginning of the development of a scientific approach to the study of memory. And uh, I also was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to work with some of the pioneers uh, in the study uh, of memory. And so they, in a sense, launched me on my own career. So I, I feel uh, fortunate, let's say, I feel fortunate and I feel satisfied uh, that I've been able to take this, uh, to this, take this journey. It, it's, it's been fun and it's been rewarding. Do you have perhaps like a favorite part of that journey or perhaps a favorite achievement? Well, let me see if uh, I have a couple of favorite parts of, of, the, of the journey. Uh, as, a, as a graduate student, uh, I was fortunate enough to be at the University of California where Edward Chase Tolman, one of the pioneer researchers in the field of memory uh, was still there and I was able to interact with him and he served on my PhD thesis committee and uh, that was very rewarding to be next to, if you like, one of the pioneers of the, of the field of, of the learning and animal learning. Another was to have a uh, postdoctoral research experience in Rome with Daniel Bove, a, a Nobel prize winner, and I spent a year with him in his laboratory and then developed a lifelong friendship with him. Uh, he not only uh, influenced my thinking and my research, but I, I think I also influenced his <laughs> thinking and research, and that's a little bit of rewarding too. So those are the two pioneering things in my um, research interaction careers early on that significantly influenced my, my thinking about science. Yeah, and I mean, I've read through your autobiography article, so to speak, that you've written, that you've actually sent me. Um, and it was by Professor Tolman that you were actually prim primarily intrigued about the uh, learning and experience problem and significance. Yes, and that's yeah, right. the, yes the, the, 
the, dis the distinction between learning and performance, which is so critical in all of our research, because all we ever see in research is performance. You're watching me perform and I'm watching you perform. And then we make inferences on the basis of that. And that's the fundamental substance of learning and memory. That's, that's how we access. We, we look at behavior and then we make inferences about how that behavior uh, was, was achieved, how it was, how it was originally developed, and how it is expressed. And it's all by looking at behavior. And that was the, the predominant influence from Edward Tillman, uh, who wrote extensively about the distinction between learning and performance and how we make such inferences. And looking at like, you know, uh, to someone who has an interest in psychology and neuroscience, but doesn't really have too much of a knowledge about it. Um, could you explain to that listener, to those listeners who fall in that category, like what is an act or if you will, a memory in and of itself. It, it sounds as a simple thing to describe, but the essence, at the essence, what is, what is actually a memory, looking at it from a psychological and neuroscience perspective? At, at, at essence, it's not simple. In essence, it's very complicated because as I just said, it's always an inference. So what is, what is a memory? Uh, all we can say is that it is a, we make inferences on, by looking at behavior that an experience has made a change. So if I say to you, one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, added together gives you three, right? Mm. That's new information. Now, how do I know that you know that? How do I know that I've created a memory? I can't look at you. I have to, I have to perform some kind of an act with you in order to draw that out. And I say to you, uh, what is one-on-one? Uh, -on -one? and you have to make a response. And then I can make an inference about whether or not what I said influenced you in such a way as to create a memory that will then affect your behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. And it doesn't make any difference whether it's a laboratory animal or whether it's a human. It's all inferential. And that's all we know about memory is based on inferences that we make from studying behavior. Do you think there will, be, there, there will ever be a step forward in terms of memory being seen as more, as, as more of uh, something that's per, uh, observed, observed by performance? Uh, say that again. I didn't quite get that. Do you think there will be like a step forward in terms of us being, or the scientists actually being able to observe a certain memory as detached from the performance itself? Well, I, there's a lot of um, effort doing that right now to try to identify systems in the brain that underlie the creation of a memory and to look at those directly without looking at behavior at all. And there are even some claims being made that, that you can get electrophysiological data either by unit analysis in animals or by, uh, by electrophysiology in humans or by uh, brain imaging. Uh, to look into the brain to see the processes directly. But I think we're at the very early, very early stages of that. But would it ultimately be uh, possible? Yes, if, if we knew what the, what the physiological substrate of memory is in the brain, and, and they are in the brain, I mean, we have to be very clear about that, then it should be possible theoretically to have some kind of measures which would access the processes in the brain. But it's not gonna be simple because memories are not gonna turn out to be in a spot in the brain or in a single change in a neuron. Uh, it's going to be, uh, uh, memories are undoubtedly represented by widespread physiological changes throughout the brain. And how one would get a measure of that, uh, to me, it escapes my imagination, but it will probably happen. Mm. It'll happen. So basically there is a theoretical possibility for it, but just because it isn't really located in one spot, it's like really difficult to measure basically. It's gonna be very, very difficult to do, but I, you know, who might have said it, it can't be done. I imagine that, that, the, that the physiological processes underlying memory will be amenable to examination at some time in the future, but not now. And like looking at this from the, from the same perspective, what about forgetting? What about the process of forgetting? Is that something that we have more, so to speak, like 
um, branched out scientific data about, or is it on the same level as acquiring memory and storing memory in and of itself? Yeah, well, forgetting is a very complicated process. Um, uh, is it a loss? Uh, no, it's not a loss because um, um, think of think of a process which is known as tip of the tongue memory. Uh, you're trying to remember somebody's name, and you can't remember it right now. Mm. Right? You've all had we've all had the experience, and you're on your bicycle or you're doing something else. Uh, Twenty minutes later, and it pops into your head. So what was going on? The memory was not lost, it was just unaccessible at that moment in time, but your brain went to work on it. You gave it instructions by saying, I'm trying to remember, and then later on, it pops in and you have the memory. Mm. So uh, memories are not always accessible, and we need to understand the processes that are involved in the making of memory and the retrieving of memory. Uh, it, it's a very complicated process. Mm, and the strength of the memory has a lot to do with that. Yes, the strength of the memory has a lot to do with that because presumably if it's uh, extremely strong, then you're not going to have the tip of the tongue memory problem. Uh, if somebody asks you, what is your name? You're not going to say, <laughs> what if I can't remember it right now? And then 20 minutes later, it pops into your head. Yeah, let me get back at you. <laughs> Uh, but if, if somebody asked you what was the name of that person who sat next to you when you were in the third grade, uh, that, that uh, little girl who sat next to you when you were in the third grade, you might say, ah, I can't remember right now, but maybe tomorrow you'll send me an email and saying, yes, I remembered the, the name of it. And what that says is that there is, there has been a change in your brain which holds that information, but it's not readily accessible and your brain goes to work on it in ways that we do not understand to try to access that and then pull it out at a later time. And then tomorrow you'll be able to send me the email and tell me. Mm, so it's a matter of actually looking at the basis of it. We don't actually know if the memories are lost in the same way that we usually think of the ways that things are lost. For example, we lose something, let's say a book, and it's never to be retrieved again. In this case, it's about the inaccessibility That's of right. a certain memory. Accessibility, and, and there's a fundamental question. Uh, uh, what, what do we learn uh, in the course of our lives that we don't even know that, that, that we have learned? Because information is being processed all the time, all the time. And we think of the dominant things that we encounter. We will remember tomorrow that we had this conversation. But will you remember tomorrow that there was a pressure on your left foot right at this moment? Mm, mm, mm. Your brain is processing that because that you have to have, you have, the brain has to understand that pressure on your left foot in order for you to stand up and walk, you see. So the those, brain, are, those are different types of memories, right? So this one would be more of a, like, if, as far as I understood, like more of an implicit memory, whereas our conversation is an explicit. Or am I being we, wrong? Yes, we have a variety of memory process. Uh, memory is not a thing. We have all kinds of memory processes. We have uh, very recent memories, so we can remember very well what just happened. And, and uh, I, I could, I could, you could imitate me right now. <laughs> I could right now and you could imitate me. You couldn't do that 10 minutes from now because that will have been gone. So we have very, very, very recent memories, extremely recent memories about what just happened that you can, you can mimic, you can repeat. And then you, in a few minutes from now, you'll have a memory that we had that discussion. And then tomorrow, you know, there'll be whatever is lasting of that is long-term memory that we had this today and we'll remember some elements of that. In the meantime, there are systems in our brain that are recording the motor movements and we have motor memories. Now we know that best when we, when we study um, uh, the, the development of skills. You learn how to play tennis, for example, and that, that's learning a motor memory, or you wrote, learn how to ride a bicycle, you learn how to do handwriting. Now, you can't even tell me how you do that. The only way you can tell me how to do it is to do it. Mm. That's, that's encoded in, in systems of the brain that handle 
the learning of motor systems. So already I've described three different kinds of memory systems. One which is very immediate, the other which is a, a memory, a verbal memory, a, a cognitive memory, and then the other is a motor system memory. Mm -hmm. All of those go are going on simultaneously, and all those memories are being retrieved simultaneously. So you have a memory of how to sit up, and you're using that right now, and I'm using that memory uh, of how to sit up, and how to talk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't even get into that, because that is so complicated, the <laughs> learning of language, the expression of language, and so on. So we don't have a learning system, we don't have a memory system, we have learning systems, and we have memory systems. Enormously complicated, and that's what make, makes it so much fun for memory researchers, uh, because the problems are not going to be solved in a, a day or a year or a decade. What do you think is the biggest question in memory research today? Uh, retrieval is the is the biggest question in memory research uh, from my perspective um i have worked and most people working in the field of memory work on the problem of creation of memories how do you make memories and what are the systems involved in making making memories that's what i've devoted my life to only in recent years has there been a, a, a more of an an, an an increased emphasis in understanding how memories are retrieved. What are the brain systems that are involved? So when I when I ask you about that third grade girl who was sitting next to you, uh, how does the brain access that information? What does it do? What are the processes that are involved in going through those decades and and it's searching and searching and searching, or even if I ask you to, to remember uh, how we started this conversation today, your brain could do that. It would start thinking about it. How does that work? How does it work? How do we access um, uh, the, the tip of the tongue memory? How does that work when, when we try to remember something? Um, I'll tell you a, a story about myself, which is kind of funny. I was uh, riding in the back seat um, of a car with my daughter and her husband driving along the freeway. And I looked over in the back of the truck and it had a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables. And I looked over there and one of the fruits I could not remember the name of. Mm. And about 20 minutes later, it popped into my head. It was pineapple. <laughs> right? That's such now, a basic thing. Uh, just 20 minutes later. And so uh, to just to tell the story, this was um, in right about our Christmas time. And so every day or every morning I would go out and I would find first the, the one day there was one pineapple on my front porch and the next day there were <laughs> pineapples. And so uh, it was the, you know, the 12 days of Christmas, except there was the 12 days of pineapples that appeared on my front porch. So that's the joke in the family, pineapple. You can't remember something, it, it's pineapple. But the point is that my brain went to work on that and 20 minutes later, long after that truck had gone by, it gave me pineapple. What is going on in our brains that, that undergirds our, our ability, our lack of ability, our, our success in retrieving information which is there? Or if you take somebody who's engaged in a sport, what is going on in the brain when it tells you how to move your legs in order to ride a bicycle and maintain the balance? What is going on when you play tennis? that gives you access, immediate access to what to do when the ball is coming quickly and so on. And uh, in my estimation, we know pathetically little, little about how our brains access the information that we have in our brains to execute the responses that we make. And I mean, what's particularly interesting to me, especially in your example, and now looking back at, for example, my uh, examples throughout my, of course, college career, so to speak, is that when you're trying to figure out a problem and when you're really focused on a problem, you cannot really solve it. Whereas if you take some space away from the problem, the solution comes basically, you could say, of course, in and of itself. And this, this has basically been something of a case, for example, for you as well, in terms of finding the name for the pineapple fruit. 
It's like you weren't focused in those 20 minutes exclusively on the name of that fruit. It's something that popped into your head, and then 20 minutes later, it was basically like a light bulb going off. Yes, because uh, in those in that 20 minutes, I wasn't thinking about it. I'm giving up on everything <laughs> else. And um, uh, I, I just cite that <clears throat> as an illustration um, to, to focus on what goes on all the time. I mean, I, I gave that as a bizarre example, but in making a sentence, how does your brain work to give me the words that I need now, to form the words, to speak the words, to retrieval? You're asking me questions and I have to retrieve a lot of information, motor information, make my jaw work to move uh, and, and smile at the right time automatically and so on in addition to pulling out the information that you're asking about. All of that requires retrieval processes, accessing and then bringing out into motor systems in order to display that information. And we know so very little about that. It's a universe to be explored. I mean, but like looking back at, uh, at something that we've been talking about previously, um, uh, so, of, of course, we were, we aren't, most of us actually aren't able, like a vast, vast majority of us aren't able to remember everything that we do, everything that has happened to us in everyday lives, so to speak. There are some, like, examples that I would like to talk about with you later on in terms of the highly superior autobiographical memory. But in terms of remembering specific things, there is the emotional significance of the experience, or not the experience, but the emotional arousal that influences the strength of a memory. But looking um, besides of that emotional arousal, what are the aspects that make us you know, remember certain things and disregard others altogether? Well, a lot of it is, is uh, just familiarity, that if, if, we are, if we're familiar with the circumstances, then it's easy to, easier to grasp the information. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you, if, you, if you know English language, it's easier to understand what is said than if you don't understand Naturally. English language. Uh, uh, so that the, the context is very important and the previous ex experience is, uh, is very important. Um, but beyond that, uh, the, the fundamental question is, what, are, what, are, what processes go on when we access information and then express that information, the, the overall retrieval of that information? It's, it's just enormously complicated. So most of the research, including almost all of my research, no, not all, but most is, uh, is focused on uh, the acquisition of information. What goes on in the brain which enables you to acquire a motor response or uh, a, a cognitive information? And what are the brain processes that regulate the storage of that? That's what I have focused on. But how do you get, how do you get it out? And we, we've, we've been silent on mm -hmm. how do you get it out? How do you access that information and actually produce it? And it requires a cooperation of cognitive information, knowledge, with expression of it, whether mm -hmm. it's moving the mouth to speak it or using the hands or some other expression or the legs and so on. And uh, that's, that's, those, are, those are problems for the future that are, I think, just incredibly important. But I mean, the part of your research that's been dealing with the making of memories is incredibly important as well. I mean, one of the, like, it, there are those things that unless they are spoken to you, they don't seem obvious, but when they are spoken to you, they seem so obvious that you're questioning yourself, how is it that I, how is it that I never um, came to think about this? And yeah. one of the things that you've written about is the making of lasting memories. Um, when you look at it, like, from the per, like from the per, first person view, you, it's like, okay, as soon as something happens, as soon as something, you know, occurs, or as soon as I take something to learn something, it's stored immediately. Whereas you're, in your research and in your work, you've um, repeatedly signified the fact that memories, long-lasting memories actually aren't stored immediately, but there is a, 
that there is a certain space and that space also gives us certain um, abilities. Could you actually explain a little bit about it? Uh, this, the, the basic notion here for which there is incredible evidence is that lasting memories are not made immediately. They're made over time. So you have an experience and that sets up a process in the brain which leads to the consolidation or the fixation of that experience. And that may take minutes, it may take hours, or it may take longer than that. So if, if I just say to you right now that uh, one plus one equals 34, one plus one equals 34, and you say, oh, now I remember that, mm -hmm. right? But we could do things to you so that you would never remember that. You, can, you think you can remember that right now. But in, in the laboratory animals, I've done things, and many of other people have done things with animals, to completely erase that. If we, if, we do the, if we apply a procedure immediately afterwards, we can prevent that learning from occurring at all. If we wait several hours, it'll learn partially. If we wait a day, there's nothing we can do. It's going to be, it's going to be permanent. And this is called consolidation. And that suggests quite clearly that there are processes in the brain which are initiated by the experience, but which continue for a period of time, fixing the memory slowly, or what we call as consolidating the memory. And these processes take a period of time. So much research, most of my research, and much research of many other uh, scientists in the field of memory has focused on understanding the processes involved in consolidating memories over a period of time. Now that, that process is quite different from the immediate memory. Two plus two equals 36 or whatever I said. That's immediate and we don't understand that at all. That's an immediate memory which is set up like that, but will evaporate pretty quickly. This other one takes a long time to, to create and then it will be lasting. So the long-term lasting memory has to be con consolidated and we focus on understanding the processes involved in that. And that's what my research has focused on over the many years. And I mean, as in the same way that there are some things that were, that were, that were done to the rats, or predominant, not predominantly, that were done to the rats in order for them to actually, in order to interrupt that process of, process of consolidation of memory, there are some drugs that you also administer during the initial period of consolidation that improved that memory as well. Yeah. So uh, in many experiments um, in my laboratory, what we've done is to train an animal. Let's take the, the uh, first the weakening of memory. Train an animal. And then afterwards, we stimulate the brain in a way to uh, give massive stimulation or we give a, a drug immediately afterwards, and the animals will never remember after that. If we give that same drug three hours later, it will have no effect and the animal will have the memory. Or more importantly, um, I've, we've done many experiments in which we train the animal, and then afterwards, we give a stimulating drug a drug which activates, activates the central nervous system, and later they will have a stronger memory of that. If we delay the administration of that drug by three hours, it will have no effect at all. Mm. So we can enhance the consolidation of an experience by giving an animal a stimulating drug if that drug is given immediately after training, but not after a delay. And that tells us that there are processes in the brain that can be activated. Then from there, we uh, ask ourselves, what goes on naturally? I mean, we were doing something experimentally, what, what goes on ordinarily? And we made a guess, and it turned out to be a good one, that stress hormones play that role for us ordinarily. So I'll, I'll play a joke on you now. Right now, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna say something which is not true, it's not true, but we're going to pretend that it is. All right. So I say, well, I've been talking with you now for 25 minutes. And, you know, I, I hate to tell you this, but you're the most stupid interviewer that I've ever had. It's absolutely <laughs> stupid. All right. Mm. <laughs> now, you may feel a little warm. You may feel a little warm, and a little embarrassed and, and so on. Well, if I hadn't have told you it was a joke, if I just said that, 
adrenaline would have been a uh, flow through you and the adrenaline then would activate your brain and of all the things that we've talked about this is the thing that you're not going to forget mm, so you're going to remember you're going to remember three years from now that i said you were a stupid interviewer <laughs> and you may not remember anything else we talked about <laughs> why because the adrenaline uh, was released the adrenaline then activated processes in the brain that turned on um, noradrenaline in the brain and in particular regions of the, of the brain, the amygdala, which is a, an almond shaped structure that we have on either side in the brain here. And when the, when the amygdala gets activated, it sends out instructions to the rest of the brain that says, and in fact, I don't know what happened, but remember that turn on the processes of storage because that's important. Mm -hmm. So we have this system in the brain, that automatically strengthens important experiences. Anything that is emotionally exciting is going to be stored more strongly because of the activation of this, this adrenaline, noradrenaline, activation of the amygdala with its projections throughout the brain to activate storage at all the sites that were activated. And that's what I have been working on most of the time in my life, my research club. Right and also the electric shocks that were administered to the rats were administered as far as I've understood to the amygdala in and of itself. We, and we stimulated the amygdala electrically and we can create very strong memories or if it's excessive stimulation of the amygdala that will block the storage. Mm. So, so that modulation of this simple little structure on either side of the brain will give either a very strong memory by influencing the strengthening of the process or if it's very strong stimulation, it can block the process. Mm, and I mean, are, have there been any significant findings in terms of using this knowledge for the consolidation of human, human memory in terms of enhancing it perhaps through a certain drug as there, there's been this famous movie, perhaps you've heard or watched it, Limitless, where the guy uses like a pill which improves his memory by a bunch. But I mean, of course, that's science fiction. Has there any, like, has there, have there been any concrete steps in terms of well, what you've uh, just described? Uh, I, I can tell you that there has been work at um, Emory University and UCLA um, showing that the same thing that we have done with laboratory animals to stimulate the amygdala works in humans as well. So they have humans that are <clears throat> about to undergo surgery for uh, epilepsy. Uh, and so they, they have to map the regions of the brain to make sure that they're not going to do a lot of damage. They have to stimulate the brain. And what they've done is to stimulate the amygdala after information is presented to show that a stronger memory is created. So the same things that we have found in laboratory animals has now been found in humans. Now, um, are, are there... Are there drugs that will make memory stronger in humans? Yes, uh, amphetamine. Mm. Amphetamine uh, works through uh, adrenaline and amphetamine works in laboratory animals. And there's extensive work by, uh, lab by laboratories in, in Holland showing that the same thing works in, in humans. Now, the thing we have to remember is that it doesn't just make memory better. What it does, it makes a stronger memory of whatever has just happened. All right. The, the experience is more vivid in and of itself. So that it, it's, it's tied to the specific experience. So that if you wanted to have a stronger memory of some very specific thing, then there are some drugs which will help you make a, a stronger memory of that thing. But you can't just take a drug and all of a sudden everything is going to be stronger. No, it's tied to the specific activation. Mm -hmm. In the same way, adrenaline. You have an experience that causes massive release of adrenaline. That's going to make that experience stronger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that there has to be a selective use of the drug with respect to an experience. You can't just take a drug which will make memory better. Yeah, yeah it's such a general, in general terms. <laughs> that's not going to happen. It's tied to a very specific experience. And mm. I'm, I'm sorry because college students would like to be able to wake up in the morning, take a drug, and then go to 
glasses and everything is going to be solved and then they don't have to study. But that's not going to happen. No. That's not going to happen. And plus, I mean, amphetamines are a thing in and of themselves. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you don't want to... I mean, the, the studies with amphetamine were used to, to support a principle. And the principle is that they work in, in humans the same way that they work in laboratory animals. But it doesn't say then that it's useful to help human memory because you, you'd have to have the amphetamine around and say, oh, I need to remember that. I have to think <laughs> or to remember that. But I don't want to remember the next thing that happens. Right. It would have to be really, really selective and really widespread yeah, at the same very, time. Very, very selective. You may end up remembering the wrong things. <laughs> but I mean... Yeah. That <laughs> so this is one of the things that's really interesting to me like there one of the first questions that I want to ask you and then I kind of reformulated throughout reading of course throughout of, about the research that you've done is about you know there's all of this um, talk about photographic memory and things of that nature whereas the topic that you were talking about is not really photographic memory it's like when somebody talks about photographic memory, they're mostly talking about, okay, I'm going to take a certain book, I'm going to glance over it, and I'm going to retrieve, you know, every word for the next 10 decades. But what you've been writing about is the case of the so-called highly superior autobiographical memory, which in layman's terms could be transcribed into photographic memory, but about the events in my life or the events of a person's life. No, uh it's not photographic. Um, mm. Let me first tell you how it happened. I had a, I received an email uh, in the spring um, 20 years ago, 2000. And uh, a young woman said that she wanted to meet with me because she had a memory problem. Now, what would you think if somebody said they had a memory problem? You they can't they, remember. They can't remember. And I said, well, I can, I'm not a, I said, I'm not a clinician. I can direct you to, to people who work with that. And she said, no, you, you may want to meet with me because I don't forget. And so I've always been interested in strong memory. I thought, well, I better meet with her. And it turns out that, um, and I studied her for about six years before we published our first paper on her. It, it turns out that she has a very strong auto, autobiographical memory. Um, she can remember uh, dates, names, uh, most of her life since she was about 12 or 13 years old, something like that, uh, and uh, remarkably well. And we tested her. Uh, I, I asked her to give me at one time the uh, the dates of the previous uh, 20 um, uh, Easter's mm -hmm. and she did. And then she also told me what she did on each of those Easter's and fortunately she uh, kept little books, little, uh, little books, diaries of her life and we were able to look into the diaries and find out that she was accurate. Now she doesn't remember every detail of her life. She remembers um, days the way that you and I remember yesterday. We have a strong memory of yesterday. Her memory of 20 years ago is going to be almost as strong as her memory of yesterday, but no more detailed. Mm -hmm. Right? You don't remember everything that happened yesterday. You remember what you did. And hers was the same. Yes, I had a fight with my mother and then I had lunch with my boyfriend and then I went for a walk. It was that kind of memory, not, uh, not detailed, precise. It was things happen, I remember what happened. Now, as a consequence of that, um, we got a lot of publicity and we're in newspapers, magazines, and then a, in a very uh, widely much watched television program, 60 Minutes, that 19 million people watched in the United States. And then I got about 600 people contacted me to say that they had the same kind of memory and we tested all of them. And we ended up with about 60 people in the United States that we could confirm had a memory that was very much like that. And so, but then we knew what it was like. It was not eidetic memory. It was not, um, uh, uh, photographic memory and, and detail. It was, they could tell me what they did 
two weeks ago, they could tell me what happened. If they were old enough, they could tell me what happened 20 years ago, uh, the days of the week and so on, but not in micro detail. And we studied them quite a bit and published several papers about that, trying to understand the, the nature of it. And we, we now know that yes, there is highly superior autobiographical memory. It is not something that subjects learn. They arrive with it. Uh, we, we found children who have the ability. Um, uh, a, an eight-year-old can remember what happened when they were five years old uh, <laughs> and so on. Uh, we even had a set of twins, ident identical twins. One, they were 13-year-old um, boys. One of them had the ability and one of them did not. And they were identical twins, which is very interesting. So yes, we know a lot about highly superior autobiographical memory. Um, now, what else do we need to know? But I mean, what in in the essence, for lack of better words, what's what what differentiates those individuals' brains and the processes within the brains from the people with normal, so to speak, memory? Well. Uh, in collaboration with, with a number of scientists, <clears throat> we looked at the structure of some of, their, of those individual brains. And then we've also looked at the uh, electrophysiological and um, activity using brain imaging procedures. And we don't know very much. Uh, in, in one study of the anatomy, uh, uh, we found that there are a couple of regions of the brain that appeared to differ, but it didn't give us any very, very strong insights. Yes, their brains were slightly different, but so what? It, it, it didn't explain anything. The more interesting work was uh, using fMRI. This was done in collaboration with colleagues in, in Italy. And what was found is that the, the brains of these subjects differ during the act of retrieval. Mm. And so it suggests that the processes in, in the subject's brains that in, are involved in retrieving information differ from those of people who don't. And once again, that takes, me, takes us back to the discussion we had previously about the importance of understanding retrieval processes. Because uh, I think that the, the answer doesn't lie in, in the ability of these subjects to store information. But to access them. Than, than you and I, but addressing the information that we have. So I think that that's my view. My view right now, based on whatever information we have, is that these subjects are just much better in retrieving information that's in the brains. And my guess is that your brain has as much information as theirs has, these highly superior autobiographical memory, uh, but my guess is that you're not as successful as they are in retrieving that information, nor am I. But more and more experiments need to be done and are being done on the subject right now. So that, that's a, a work in progress. Yeah, but what is particularly interesting yet again is that these people, as far as I've understood, um, it's only a matter of remembering the events from their lives. They, it's not shown that they are particular, like that they are more successful in retrieving information about other things, for example, the things that they have learned. No, no. We did a lot of work on that. Uh, we thought, initially, we thought they were just better learners. And so we brought them into the laboratory and uh, gave them a lot of laboratory learning tests. And they were no different from ordinary subjects and the ability. Um, they, they selectively pay attention to their to their own lives. One, one of the interesting experiments that, that one of my uh, students did was to sit down and have a conversation with them uh, and then later on test them about the conversation. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that they remembered everything that they had said and done, but they didn't pay any attention to what the experimenter had said and done. So it's, it's they're, they're very much uh, lives are, are centered on their on their own lives but the other the other thing uh is that um uh they um they they tend to um 
uh, be obsessive and compulsive. Uh, and, we, and we've tested them not only in standard tests of that, but uh, we could see that we got clues from the behavior. For, for example, uh, I, when we got some clues, then I began to ask all of them, uh, are you obsessive compulsive? And they would all probably admit, admit that they were. I saw one case, there was a young man we were testing and um, he had a, a stack of um, napkins in front of him while I was testing. And I said, uh, do you have any obsessive tendencies? He said, well, yes, I guess I do. And I said, well, tell me about it. And he, and he picked up one of the napkins and he held it in his hand and he said, well, I carry these because you can never tell who's touched the things you're going to touch. Oh. Like, some things. So he was obsessive about that. Um, uh, the most famous one is a Hollywood actress um, uh, who uh, claims that she's not obsessive, but then she showed uh, a dis uh, in taking people through her house, went into her bedroom and her closet. She has all of her shoes lined up, <laughs> the toe in, toe out, and all of the dresses organized by last time she wore them. And she remembers the, the dates on which she purchased each of those shoes and each of those dresses in her closet, but she's not compulsive, she says. <laughs> so, but there, there's, there's something about obsessive and compulsiveness and um, the focus on one's own life, but uh, it's an ability, a, a, a tendency that they've had from early on in life, nothing that's acquired, they're just something about the brains that processes information in that way. They're very intriguing. And it's a form, it's an aspect of memory that was not known until this young woman approached me in 2000. And now it's widely known and widely under study in many laboratories throughout the world. And it's also perhaps a case looking at it from like the self perspective, a case for um, the brain being naturally predisposed to, you know, only look for itself and to only remember the things that matter to it the most. That is only right. to look at itself, and the others can come second. <laughs> right. and that's probably a general principle, but they they express that much more strongly than the ordinary person. Yes, but like you mentioned, like you emphasized a couple of times that this is no case of uh, photographic memory. So, is there actually such a thing as photographic memory, or is it just like some sort of a myth? The only case that I think has ever been strongly validated is the, the young uh, man, and he's not a middle-aged man in, uh, in England, um, who is uh, uh, autistic, and he's an artist, and you may, you may, may know of him, uh, who has extraordinary ability to remember um, photographic details. So what they do is they, they put him in a helicopter and they fly him over a city. And they've flown him over Rome, over Tokyo, over Mexico City, and over London and maybe other places. And the next day then, they, they put sheets of paper on the wall. And then he draws the view of the, of the city from the helicopter that he saw. And it's remarkably accurate, remarkably accurate. And he's autistic, so he can't talk about how he does it. He just, he just does it. And that's the only really uh, highly verified case uh, in such detail. Now, there are other examples. There is a, a sculptor, uh, an American sculptor, uh, who is autistic. Uh, lives in Colorado, and he sculpts horses, and they're in museums. If you're interested in buying one, there may be thirty, forty thousand dollars for a sculpture. And he's, he's autistic, but he doesn't look at horses when he sculpts them. Mm. Mm. Sculpts them from memory. Mm. So those are those are examples I know of. So the only people who have uh, eidetic or photographic memory that I'm aware of are these autistic uh, artists 
Um, and there may be more, there may be more. I'm just, these are the ones that I, that I know of who are, uh, who are well known, but it's not common. It's not common. Yeah, I mean, plus the connection between autism and like remarkable memory has always been like really, really, you know, fascinating to me, you know, all the way from watching various movies to real life examples where, you know, out, uh, people with autism um, can remember. And this is also one of the things that I read in your research papers and in your autobiography is that, you know, the people who can um, tell you, so this might not be so much so, it might be actually a combination of the capacity to retrieve but also to look forward in a way in terms of like uh, being able to point out um, certain dates like 40 years before and 40 years into the future and telling you exactly which days it was or it will it be and what happened on that day so it's really remarkable you know the link the link between the two and I, I, I should also point out that I a fairly large number of parents, I'd say as many as maybe 30 or so parents have written to me to say that their children have this ability, um, a highly superior autobiographical memory, and they say, also, my child is on the autistic spectrum. Now, we, we couldn't test all of, those, all of those people, but I can tell you that, that I think that the highly superior autobiographical memory is uh, also on the autistic uh, spectrum uh, in, in, in some way. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident uh, of that as well. You know. it's, it's a fascinating subject. And I, I, I think I've already told you this in, in our email exchange, like if I weren't um, studying, if I didn't go into political science for my bachelor's and not for my master's in economy, I think that um, psychology would have been one of the things that I would actually, not one of the things, but the thing that I would most definitely go into studying. I believe most, in, the most important reason behind that would be basically because the human behavior and everything that goes beha- before it and after it is so intriguing. I believe it's like, it's, it's like a universe in and of itself. Like no matter how much you know about the universe, you'll never know enough. You'll never know, not enough, but you'll never know everything. And it's all these like, you know, you find one solution, which brings to 10 other problems. <laughs> uh, as, as I think, think you know, if you read my autobiography, uh, autobiography uh, I, I started uh, the university as a drama major. Yes. <laughs> uh, I really thought that the, the Greek plays gave all of the answers to understanding human nature. And the Greek plays do a lot of that. And then when I got to university, I discovered that there was a field called psychology, which actually studied that. And so I, I, I moved drama to a minor rather than a, a major interest. And then I gravitated more to physiology and then to try to understand the brain. Uh, but it really is, it really is fascinating, and and it, the problems are never going to be completely understood, and they remain uh, intriguing and attractive and uh, seductive. <laughs> Even um, your biography, in and of itself, like not even looking at the scientific portion of it is really, really remarkable. And the experiences that you've gone through and, you know, being um, having taught both by yourself and your immediate friends and, and family, that is that you will be a car mechanic at the beginning, you know, nobody suspecting that you will go into science nor, you know, less psychology and less neuroscience even. So um, it's, it's really one of the things that I would like to perhaps sometimes in the future maybe touch upon in a later episode because we're approaching that one hour mark that we were speaking about. But just to touch it briefly right now, what do you think it has been perhaps like, okay, so what's the most significant memory um, that you think has most significantly influenced your life and career? A memory that's influenced my life and career.
That's a tough one. Um, I, I can I can tell you experiences that that um, as you know my father died when I was young and so I was kind of on my own. Uh, what what influenced me um, was the, the knowledge that I could do things by myself. So I learned uh, early on bicycle repair, and I became the bicycle repairman for the entire neighborhood. Uh, I had to repair it because the only bicycle I could have was a broken down one, and I could fix it, and then I could have a bicycle. And then the rich kids in my neighborhood had uh, motorbikes, and I couldn't afford a motorbike because I was poor, and so I got an old motor and I put on a bicycle and I made a motorbike and then I worked in a machine shop and I got a better motor and made a really nice motorbike that looked like a motorcycle. <laughs> and I think those are the things that made me is that, that um, I learned that I had to do things by myself and then I could do them and then I could explore and, and, and nothing it was it was impossible i mean that's those are the things that influenced me and and maybe that's what drives my research interest also is because i believe that we can understand if we can do the right experiment we can understand and i think that came from those early experiences where i really was on my own um surviving and uh, having fun and the, that's actually the emphasis that you've been putting on taking initiative to initiative, every, self-initiative, everything is possible, almost everything. Yes, yes, yeah, that, that's the story of my life. So um, thank you very much for your time, Professor. Before we end this, I would just like to ask you, because the audience that's listening to this podcast is primarily between the ages of 18 to 25 and 25 to 34, um, what might be the, the message from you to young people? Study hard, study hard. Um, don't think that you know for sure what you want to do because your life may change. Uh, be, open to, be open to new information, uh, please. Um, be socially engaged. Uh, look out for other people, please. Please try to take care of other people. And remember that we all have to share this planet. Um, so when you're looking for leaders in the world, please support leaders who understand that we share the planet. Yeah, that we're not alone, that we're not individuals, but a part of a broader, broader society. We're part of a world and we all have to share it and we ought to preserve it and hope that there will be a future for people like you in the future. Okay, thank you very much for that, Professor. Thank you very much for your time. And I really sincerely hope that you enjoyed it as much as I have, and that there will be a second chance to talk again. Thank you very much. I have enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, and talk to you soon. Bye-bye.